Argincourt, Northern France, 1415. King Henry V of England and his 7,000 men are hungry and weak. The pouring rain does them no favors either. A failed invasion sees the English army on their way back to Calais to avoid the French army. But the Kingdom of France has other plans. After shadowing the starved army for much of their trek, the 15,000 French soldiers were eager for a slaughter. Swords were drawn, and the battle joined, on this St. Crispin's Day. But what was the King of England doing in France, invading with such a small force? Between 1337 and 1453, France and England were locked in the Hundred Years' War, a conflict for the French crown. It began with English King Edward III, who was the grandson of Philip IV of France, claiming he was heir to the French throne. England had great victories early on, at Crecy and Poitiers, but Edward eventually renounced his claim to the throne in 1360, simply keeping his conquered territory in France. Once Charles V took over in France, his army would slowly take back the land they lost to Edward. By 1375, the only main piece of land England had left in France was a piece of Gascony and Calais. After a brief period of peace, Henry V would become English king in 1413. The French king at this time was Charles VI, but after descending into madness, he was now known as Charles the Mad. With the French king ineffectual, France would become fragmented, and the nobility divided. Oh so ripe, to conquer. After all, Henry still believed himself to be a legitimate heir to the throne. Landing in Normandy with around 10,000 men, Henry captured the port of Harfleur, but the siege took a grueling five weeks, crippling his army. Apart from the French, his soldiers would need to fight the unseen as well, as dysentery struck, culling half of Henry's men. His Pyrrhic victory would leave him with just five to 7,000 men, and he would now have to lead his army, not straight to Paris, but to Calais, the only other English holding in France. Supply lines ran dry, and his meager number of men had to fight just to keep walking. Shadowed by the French at every step, Henry was cut off from Calais, so decided to stand his ground and fight, as battle was inevitable, and any delay would just risk more French troops joining. And so, after a 420 km march, it was here at Agincourt, with a sick and starving army, on a mud-filled battleground between onlooking trees, that King Henry fought, against all odds. His army consisted of around 1,000 men-at-arms, lightly armored mounted units, and 6,000 archers, mainly longbowmen. These longbowmen were equipped with bows made of the finest yew wood, strung with hemp, giving them the ability to pierce armor. The adept archers in Henry's army could fire up to 15 arrows in a minute. The French side was led by Charles d'Albray, constable of France, and the knight and military leader, Boussicot. Their army consisted of archers as well, around 5,000, but they would rely on crossbowmen more. The crux of their army were their men-at-arms, around 10,000 strong, which consisted of the fearsome, heavily armored French knights. While d'Albray and Boussicot planned to surround and starve out the English army, the French dukes were more impatient, and forced a direct attack. Their forces were three to four times stronger. What could possibly go wrong? Trees to his right and left, mud up to the knees, Henry's army forced the French army to attack directly from the front, by placing wooden stakes in the ground, negating the French army's numerical advantage. Those who had to run through the thick mud were encumbered by their armor, reaching the enemy, already fatigued. Those who fell over, were stuck in the mud, and drowned in their own helmets. But it was the English longbowmen who truly took the day. Stationed in the flanking woods, with their wooden stakes as protection, the longbowmen were able to pick off the French knights as if they were in a shooting gallery. Most horses had no armor on their sides, so once a horse was shot, and a knight dismounted, he was rendered almost useless in the muck, and, moving at a snail's pace, was easily dispatched by the archers. Volleys of arrows continued to be fired, 
both at point-blank range, and at great distances rarely seen in medieval warfare. Even when arrows were exhausted, the lightly armored archers would take to melee fighting to continue the battle. The result? Only 600 of Henry's men suffered casualties, less than one-tenth of his force. The French lost at least 7,000, although estimates are more around 10,000 troops, anywhere from a half to two-thirds of their army. Dalbray, constable of France, also met his demise, along with 2,000 knights and numerous dukes and barons. They would also lose many prisoners of war, as King Henry ordered a number of them killed, to avoid them rejoining the fight. After reaching Calais and returning to England, Henry V was proclaimed a national hero. Among the prisoners of war in his procession were the Duke of Orleans, the nephew of the Mad King of France, and Boussico, who probably resented the dukes for getting him into this mess. With more resolve than ever, Henry would invade France again soon after, taking Normandy and entering Paris. The English king succeeded in his mission, and was made regent, being next in line to the throne after Charles the Mad. He would even marry the French king's daughter, Catherine of Valois, who had his son, to ensure the lineage would continue. He was also visited by Sigismund of Luxembourg, and inducted into his Order of the Dragon, the same order of chivalry as Vlad the Impaler, and where the name Dracula comes from. It was all for naught however, as Henry would unexpectedly die, in 1422, just a few months prior to Charles. With his death, his son's right to the throne was disputed, and the crown went to Charles VII, the son of Charles the Mad. With the emergence of Joan of Arc in 1429, the war shifted to France's favor, and the English lost most of their territories on the mainland, by the end of the Hundred Years' War, in 1453. While England ultimately lost the war, Henry remained a national hero, with aid from the Bard of Avon, who immortalized the king in his play, Henry V. As St. Crispin's Day nears, Englishmen everywhere can remember Shakespeare's rendition of Agincourt, and the rousing speech from the English leader to his band of brothers, on that fateful eve, of St. Crispin's Day.